with us on a journey into the unknown, the unexplained, and the unbelievable. We will test your senses and challenge your beliefs. A world where science and religion clash. Or do they? You will meet real people and hear real stories, but you will not believe. You will witness strange sights and hear strange sounds, but you will not believe. This is the New England Ghost Project. Welcome to the Nightmare. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition, a video edition, of Ghost Chronicles Next Generation. I am Ron Kolick, of course, and with me, right next to me, in our fabulously new <laughs> cheers, is the blonde bombshell herself, Ann Kerrigan. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. And uh, yes, here we are in front of our beautiful roaring fire. Isn't it great? It's our lovely uh, EBC TV studios. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's our angel and our beautiful new table. Oh, yes. Right. We are really coming up in the world. Yep. These are the chairs that we rescued. <laughs> you notice I got the mama chair. She's got the papa chair. Yeah, that tells yeah, you a lot right yeah. there. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Whatever. Mm -hmm. So anyways, here we are this evening. And we're going differently a little bit. Yeah. Little, it little. is and it isn't. Because uh, we're going to talk about religion and the paranormal. Yes. Right. Isn't, that, isn't that one of those taboo things you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to talk about uh, in polite company? Religion, politics. And sex. And sex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you won't have to worry about the politics here. So, uh, But tonight we are going to talk a little bit about religion. No, no, please, no, 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 no. We're not going to discuss that man. He who shall not be named, we're not discussing him. Oh, so she's quite in Bible now. She's really getting into the mood. <laughs> the Bible, that's Harry Potter. Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyhow, mm -hmm. so yeah, well, we were, uh, we were kind of chatting about, well, what should we do the next video broadcast on? And, right. uh, and nobody wanted to do it with us. So yeah, we said, nobody oh, wanted to be our guest. We'll do it ourselves. You know, so what the heck? <laughs> so uh, we decided, um, kind of based on where our cemetery tripping was um, this month, the, the cemetery tripping that we'll be playing in a couple minutes, um, we got talking about one of the graves there and... Right. You know, kind of. Ron said, "Well, let's go in that direction." So we did. That's what we're going to do. Right. So it all started when we got these chairs. <laughs> it's um, all about the chairs, right? You know, I mean, we it's went all down. About we went, those chairs. Yeah. About those chairs. You told me that was passe. Never to mention that yeah, again. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I couldn't. She resist. really cried at, at the Oscars. It was sad. Oh, did she get an Oscar? Not an Oscar, well, a Grammy. Grammy, whatever. Oscar, <laughs> Grammy, <laughs> Freddie, I don't know what they are. Good for her. Yeah. Well, anyway, so yeah. continue. Yeah, so we, we went to uh, get the cheers, and uh, of course we had to go cemetery tripping, right? Yes. Right. So yes, We always. found this lovely cemetery. You found, you found this lovely I cemetery. Did. And uh, we went in, and that's how it all started. So without further ado, since we did mention the cemetery and cemetery, why don't we just go right into that then? Absolutely. Russ, can you roll our cemetery tripping? Welcome to Cemetery Tripping, where I will feature a different cemetery in each episode that I hope you will seek out and enjoy as much as I do. As an avid taphophile or lover of tombstones, I spend a lot of time in the local New England area in the beautiful and historic cemeteries we have here. The stones here are like no others, and I have literally thousands of pictures of the intricate and symbolic carvings found on them. You can see my pictures on Facebook by doing a search for Cemetery Tripping. Today we are visiting Precious Blood Cemetery in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, also known as Rhode Island Historical Cemetery No. 6. This cemetery is set in the middle of a residential area in the city, amongst the three-deckers and busy streets. The entrance, which is a large iron gate, bearing the name in French, sits at one corner of a very busy intersection. You must be quick to enter here or take a picture. With over 16,000 burials, this is an enormous cemetery and the largest in Woonsocket, with a portion of it actually lying in Blackstone, Massachusetts. 
This is a French cemetery with most of the inscriptions in that language. The first and most striking thing you will see upon entering is the Greek style monument situated at the top of the hill, overlooking the entire cemetery. I was fortunate to catch it as the sun was setting and it looked particularly amazing in this light. A rotary of sorts is directly below this monument and ringed with statuary, mausoleums, and of course, my favorite angel, the angel of grief. There are small angel statues throughout the portion of the grounds I visited, along with numerous metal and wooden crosses which look to be homemade. This cemetery's main claim to fame, beyond its fabulous stonework, is the grave of America's only stigmatic. A quick definition is one who bears the wounds of Jesus Christ. Marie Rose Ferrin, also known as the Petite Rose. Although we arrived late in the afternoon at the cemetery, I was able to shoot this quick video at her very humble grave. I'm here in Precious Blood Cemetery in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. And we're standing at the grave of Rose Ferron, also known as La Petite Rose. And Rose was the United States only stigmatic. She is buried here in Precious Blood Cemetery and uh, she died at age 34, very young. It was said that for the last 10 years of her life, she bore the wounds of Jesus from the crown of thorns, hands, and other marks. And when she died at 34, became very famous. Uh, they used to allow you to leave offerings at the grave, can no longer do that. She also has a large uh, tomb erected to her in Chicago. But for right now, this is her very humble and simple tomb here at Precious Blood. Since this cemetery is so large, I will be visiting it again in the near future to photograph more graves. If you visit, make sure to set aside a good portion of your day to explore. And if you have the inclination, be sure to stop by Rose's grave to say hi and offer a quick prayer. Okay. Wow. So that's how we kind of got on the topic of religion in the paranormal. Right. You know, because we went to Precious Blood and learned about Rose Ferron, um, who was the only U.S. stigmatic Right. Stigmatic, however you want to say it. Mm -hmm. um, she is not a saint. A lot of a lot of uh, people who have that uh, stigmata have been made saints. She is still not, but um, she was considered a mystic, um, basically because she spoke with God um, and had the direct expression of God, you know, through the stigmata on her head and her hands and her feet. But, uh, so that was a really interesting thing. And, yeah, and you, were, you were saying earlier, uh, before the show, in fact, is, you know, why are we talking about religion and the paranormal? Because mm -hmm. this isn't normal, is it? No. No matter what the beliefs are or whatever, it's not normal. This, this stigmatic, right. this other things that happen are paranormal. Right, right, and, and to, to me, Totally, it's it's the same thing. It's as paranormal as talking about UFOs or Big or foot. Bigfoots yeah. or or whatever that happens that is out of the norm for regular people. Like Donald Trump. So, <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah, like him, okay. like that guy. Moving right along. So, so, so wait, but people might say, what is a stigmata? Right, right. We. Um, and the stigmata, as, as I mentioned in the video, was, um, you know, having the stigmata. Let me take this back one step. When I was looking for a cemetery in, uh, in Rhode Island, an interesting cemetery to go to, because we went and got these lovely chairs down in Rhode Island and uh, in Woonsocket. So, you know, I asked my friend, uh, Brenda from the Gravestone Girls, I'm like, what's a good cemetery in Rhode Island? And uh, she suggested a few, and then I Googled a few, and I came up with Precious Blood, and she said, oh, yes, yes, go to Precious Blood, because there's a stigmatic there. And I'm like, 
I'm not really sure what that is. I should know what it is. I'm Catholic. I should know what stigmata is. Um, but stigmata is... You're also blonde. You so know, yeah, I'm fault. blonde, so yeah. whatever. Yeah. So anyways, I looked that up. I'm like, yeah, we're there. We are going to the cemetery. So uh, we went and we visited Rose, and, and that was cool. And there were some dried roses there, and there was a coin that Van Helsing was trying desperately to dig out from between the cracks of there, the... There actually uh, is some more footage that we don't have. Curb, uh, yeah. Thing. You don't want to see the rest of the footage. No. So, <laughs> anyways. And I, um, I, I took a dollar bill, and, and I ripped a dollar bill in half, did. and I left half there, and I took half home and been sleeping with it under my and pillow. that's his offering. Yeah. Half so, of his, so that I would have this box. connection. You yeah. You know, but uh, I've been told I should take the other half back when we go and leave it there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then All I right. can take something else instead. Oh, take something? Yeah, get some change for my money. Take, <laughs> take some change. <laughs> take 50 cents back. Um, so there is a religious program, and Van Helsing brought this to my attention, um, called uh, Mother, Mother Angelica. Is, is that the whole I'm name? I'm going to let you go with this. this is, Thanks a this lot. This is so much fun. I know. Watch me squirm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's, there is this very religious show called Mother Angelica. Is it Speaks? But anyway, she's it's a on nun. the Eternal Word Network, just to let you know. The Eternal Word Network, folks. Mm -hmm. Look it up. So I hop on YouTube, and uh, there is a uh, thank you, Russ. Du what was that? W what? W T N. W T N. E W T N. Okay. So, anyways, I hop on YouTube, and bam, here's the show about Rose Farone with uh, Mother Angelica. So, I just took a little snippet of that, and um, Mother Angelica is interviewing uh, Jean Savard Bonin, who is Sounds the French to me. author of, oh, yes, French Canadian author of A Stigmatist, which was written in 1988. Mm -hmm. And uh, she lived, I mean, what happened with Rose Ferone is that she moved from Canada, because her father couldn't find work, moved down to Fall River, um, and then eventually ended up in Woonsocket, where there was a huge French population. So what happened with the author of this book is that she lived two doors down from Rose Farone. Seriously? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And went and visited with her. So that's like 667 Neighbor of the Beast. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so went and actually met Rose Farone and saw, uh, you know, the what. The stigma or what, anything? Yeah. Really? Saw these wow. things. So anyways. That's cool. Can we, pull, we're going to play a clip now, and it's just a couple minutes from this interview. Uh, with this woman, and Mother Angelica is going to explain about stigmata, and then the author of the book is going to talk about what was, what was observed uh, when it occurred. So hmm. let her rest. Sounds interesting. I know some of you are just saying, what in the world are we talking about? Well, there are many people in the world. I've often thought, that there are many people throughout the, throughout the centuries, uh, every century has had its stigmatism. The first that we know of for sure was St. Francis of Assisi, and there have been many, you know, Teresa Neumann, and, and there have been uh, uh, Padre Pio, and even Catholic, the great Saint Catherine of Siena, who had the stigma. And that means that they suffer the very wounds and the very pain that Jesus suffered, not in the same way, because they're finite creatures, but the purpose of this is to make reparation for all the sins in the world and a constant reminder to us of the, the action of God upon the soul and to make reparation for all the sins, the many, 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 many sins in the world. And so many of them suffer flagellation. I mean, they, on their body appears these terrible wounds of Jesus. Some had the crown of thorns. A woman I knew, Mrs. Wise, had that and the stigmata. And, and they bleed every Friday on the anniversary of our Lord's uh, death and crucifixion. And I know it's a mystery. Suffer from 5 in the morning till 12. The, she would suffer the passion. She was in pain, something in agony. And that started uh, that way. Then she went into uh, every week. 
at uh, every Thursday night around midnight, she'd start her wounds would start to open, and she would bleed and bleed. And uh, the, 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 the son, uh, the, uh, Bill, the brother of Rose, the younger brother, uh, would uh, describes it. And he said his mother would uh, have to put big uh, towels because it would squirt on the, the blood would ooze on the walls and everywhere. And then she uh, the feet, the hands, the crown of thorns, three quarters of an inch of blood under her eyes. And she represented- That's all during the passion. The passion, and she represented the holy face of our Lord. My, uh, Bill says, I was so surprised once to come in to see my sister, and to see it was not my sister anymore, it was Jesus. Whoa. Okay. That's pretty heavy. So, yeah. So that's, that's a little bit of an explanation about what stigmata is. The interesting thing about her, too, is she is one of somewhere between 11 and 13 <laughs> children. <laughs> a little bit. Well, it said, I think, I, there was con we're having confusion here because I think she had 11 sisters. Yeah. Um, but And each one, I, the mother devoted to a um, segment of the, the rosary. And this is a, a rosary, and this is a, a segment, one from here to here. Mm -hmm. And her segment, or whatever it's called, uh, deck, I think it's called, um, was turned out to be the crucifixion fiction. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, neat. And she took on the stigmata, which is the wow. wounds of the crucifixion. So I thought that was intriguing. That too. is really neat. Yeah. I hadn't read that anywhere. Yeah. That's that's an interesting little tidbit. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing about a stigmatic is, you can't be a stigmatic unless you accept it. Mm -hmm. In other words, you have to accept it to, to be it. In other words, because you're basically, uh, I remember one of the sections I was reading was called a victim soul. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so you have to accept that. That's not just, you know, thrown on you. So okay. you, you have to take that. Imagine doing something like that. It's just no. amazing. No, and it was, and there's, there's so, you know, in my research, I've, I've found that there were, you know, quite a few other very famous stigmatics. Oh, yeah. And, but I can't imagine, and usually um, they're very devout at a young age. Mm -hmm. um, like she, Rose was like 12 when uh, she decided to, she wanted to go into, um, you know, to be a nun. Mm -hmm. And I mean, imagine deciding that at age 12. Um, but she got very sick. Uh, around that age, mm -hmm. and you know how she gets sick. Well, it said that she went to bring her father dinner, yeah, and missed the trolley. So uh, she walked and and was out in the cold and the slush, and, and she became and, paralyzed. And she came home, had a high temperature, and she became. She woke up the next day. She couldn't move her arms, and then eventually did become paralyzed, mm -hmm. and she was bedridden. Mm -hmm. She was bedridden, but she did all these, she did miracles, and she had this, you know, this horrible stigmata, so as you heard her say, you know, there's all this blood everywhere, mm. but, um, but she did accept it, and, you know, that, that was her lot uh, in life. person than I could. I yeah, mean, that's yeah, and there's, but there's, there's so many, so I'm, I'm now researching this, you know. Uh, this is intriguing. For the show, it is kind <laughs> yeah. of intriguing. And, and I feel it totally fits in the paranormal category. This is not a normal thing. Um, and something else is that, I mean, we, we have these other people. We have uh, uh, one from Italy, uh, Gemma Umberta Maria Galgani. That's easy for you to say. I know. <laughs> And Russ, if you want to throw up a picture of her, we have a couple uh, pictures of, of Gemma. And I don't, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. Maybe it's Gemma, maybe it's Gemma. I'm not Italian, so I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, but she was also a stigmatic. And she uh, was another one of, of a large family in Italy. And she just, uh, started talking to the saints and God and saw the Virgin Mary and and told her parents this and uh, the same the same deal she became very ill it's almost like that's a part of it 
-hmm. and uh, she had tuberculosis. And uh, so she uh, was cared for uh, her whole life, and again, with the stigmata. And she actually became a saint. She was recognized and became a saint. And, but yeah, with, with these people who are stigmatics, so what's the difference between you're talking to God, you're talking to the saints, you you're seeing to, visions. Yeah. So that sounds like a psychic, mm -hmm. someone who is psychic. Mm -hmm. um, I feel, isn't that along similar lines? Yeah, absolutely. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have Padre, Padre Pio who was uh, also from Italy, and he was actually, he was a monk, and, uh, um, excuse me, a friar. He was a friar and a priest, and he started, even as a child, he said to his mother, um, you know, that he was able to see and speak with Jesus, the Virgin Mary, and his guardian angel. And that as a child, he assumed that all people could do this. And they say that about psychic children. Exactly. Yeah. Is that they see people, they talk to people. Indigo children, yeah. Indigo children, yeah. yeah. And they think that everybody is like this because that's how they've grown up. So I just think um, that is a really fascinating parallel between people who are psychics. Do we have a picture of Padre Pio. Um, yeah, could we have put it? We have a picture of Padre Pio. I can't even pronounce his full name. Oh, don't even try. <laughs> <laughs> don't even try. Padre Pio works. But uh, he, he was interesting, too, Ian, in that he was able to be in two places at once. He was? Yes, he was. Oh. There he is. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Not a bad looking and guy. And there's yeah. another one that he has uh, the signs of the, the stigmata on him. There he is. Um, with the wounds on his hand. Oh, yeah, wounds that on was his him hand. as a young man. Um, how was he able to be in two places at once? They were seeing him in two places at once. Oh, really? Yeah. People were seeing visions of him? Not visions of him. He was actually there. Really? Yeah. When he was still alive? When he was still alive. He wow. would be in one place, and somebody else would meet with him, talk with him in another place, and he'd be not there. Oh, wow. Isn't that freaky? That's pretty crazy. Mm. Um, and can we just put up Russ for a minute, um, going back to Rose Ferron, can we put her picture up? Just so um, I have actually numerous pictures of, of Rose Ferron. Um, yeah, so just, yeah, I can put one of those up. But, you know, I mean, she, she was a victim soul. And, and you know, one of the, the interesting thing about it is that uh, how this kind of all started was that uh, she belonged to a French parish, French Canadian parish, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, there she oh, is. There right she there. is. That's one picture. Mm -hmm. And um, the archdiocese uh, decided to uh, tax the parish so that they could build schools, mm -hmm. while the French Canadians had their own school and they didn't want any part of this. Okay. So they they kind of had this big revolt, mm -hmm. and she took on this. Uh, revolt to to mend it and what she did is once this started happening is that each members of each person in the revolt even though they were adamant about it mm -hmm. they changed their mind and decided to go back to the the parish wow yeah, so she they said she had great influence upon that just through her suffering mm. that's amazing all kinds of strange stuff that is that is amazing and then there is also a picture in there, if we can just put the picture up for a moment, of, uh, of Gemma Gagliani. Yeah, good luck for Gagliani. that. Gagliani. I'm sorry. There is she her? is. Yeah. And she was very beautiful. What year was that? Um, I don't know what. Around a decade or something. No. no, that's OK. Let me look in my notes. No, I don't it's, it's, it's unimportant. <laughs> well, she was born in 1878. Okay. So I think sure, that picture time. of her, she was probably in her late teens mm -hmm. um, or around 20, 20 years old. So that would have been right before the turn of the century, so around 1898. Cool. Um, and then there, I think there's another one of her when she actually was suffering the wounds? from the wounds. 
okay, that's her family around. That's her family around her bedside at her death. So, uh -oh. um, so okay. that that I think is. Wait, do I have another stigmatic? Wait, there's one more stigmatic. Okay. I know we have to move on. Okay. Uh, good. We have time. Flipping through my notes here. I should put some more okay. work into this. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we can lose that picture now, Russ. Thanks. Uh, the next, the next stigmatic that I found uh, is French, Martha, and I'm assuming it looks like Robin. Uh, it's probably Robin. Um, and she was a founder of the Foyers de Charité and a reported stigmatist. Mm -hmm. uh, she became bedridden until she was 21 years old, when she was 21 years old, and remained so until her death. And uh, she was another one. Uh, ha she had typhoid fever and couldn't get out of bed, couldn't walk. Uh, and also suffered with the wounds of the stigmatic. And there's, poor oh. thing, yeah, kind of a, kind of a mess, but uh, had that crown, you know, the, the bleeding from the crown of mm -hmm. Christ, um, crown of thorns. And this is another woman who I believe is up for um, beatification. So when you're going to become a saint, someone wants to make you a saint, you have to go through this big process. So what, what uh, big process? It's, there's pages, and I mean, one of these, this woman has a file of 17,000 pages submitted oh, to the really? Vatican in 1996, and she's not a saint yet that I could find. Hmm. Uh, so 17,000? 17, 17,000 pages. Wow. Uh, so she uh, was declared in uh, 2014 by Pope Francis, uh, was declared venerable, and a recognition of a miracle could open the door to her beatification. So that is my uh, stigmatic mm -hmm. presentation. You know what the interesting <laughs> thing about it, Ann, is that, you know, we, we talk, you know, everybody talks about uh, you know, possession and stuff like that mm -hmm. and, and all that, that mm -hmm. thing and, and how the Catholic Church just jumps on it. It's not an easy thing. They go through that stuff very thoroughly. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like that, 17,000 and right. you're not, you know, they, they don't just accept everything that, that's mentioned. You know, right. mm -hmm. they, they do their work, yeah. uh, you know, to get a, uh, an, an exorcism performed, you have to go through a, a lot. You really do. The really? psychological doctors and everything else that you have to go through before the the uh, thing. There are other methods of exorcism that, but the, talking about the main mm -hmm. Catholic Church, um, and the same with uh, sainthood and uh, and the, you know they have they have a museum of all paranormal stuff basically at, in the Vatican. Really? They do. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I thought you'd like that. <laughs> <laughs> I would too. <laughs> oh, museum. Yeah. Road trip. <laughs> Honey, Ron and I have to go to the Vatican yeah, that's on a paranormal over good, yeah. research mission. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, and, and they, they have lots of things like relics. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you know what a relic is? I do not know what a relic is. Okay. What's a relic? So we're going to talk about, well, I'm going to talk about relics. Uh, we're going to talk about relics. Okay. Uh, so. Russ, if you'll get my list of top relics per ready, uh, we will go to it, but don't start yet. Uh, so anyways, uh, the word relic is derived from the Latin word meaning re reliquus, meaning, guess what, reliquus, would you guess? What would you guess? Relinquish? Yeah, what do you think it would mean? Um, to give something up? Uh, close enough. Well, that would be the definition. Uh, it means left behind. Left behind. Yeah, we okay. like this. Yeah. So basically, yeah, you give it, but you leave it behind. Mm -hmm. So anyways, the word is derived from reckless, which means left behind. Relics have always played an important part in religion, and not only Catholic religion, but many others. Mm -hmm. uh, more than decaying body parts uh, <laughs> and stained rag or cloths, uh, these items became the physical embodiment of God's work on earth. Oh. Uh, many churches uh, during the Middle Ages, okay, this is interesting, I cashed in on the hype oh. and created their own religious relics. Oh, nice. Uh, 
at one time there was more than seven heads of John the ba Baptist. Ew. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, so, I mean, there's, you know, this, you know, if it was a way to make money, then, they, you know, back at that time, especially in the medieval. Wow. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so there were different classes of relics. Okay. Okay, there are three classes. The first class relic is actually a pot of the saint. A pot? Yeah, a pot. A pot. A pot. Excuse our New England accent. Like a pot. bone, hair, Oh, blood. okay, a pot. Okay. Okay. Which I actually have a first class relic in, in the blood of uh, St. Chabelle, which we will talk about later. Uh, the second class relic is something that is owned by the saint or instrumental or an instruments of torture that we used against the martyr. Oh. Okay. So they have they have torture devices? Yeah, so yeah, nice. these can become relics. Uh. And the, <laughs> this is the interesting one though, okay? Uh -huh. A third class relic. A third class class relic is j consists of something that has touched a first or second class relic. Anyone can make their own third class relic by touching an object against the first and second oh, class relic. Oh god. <laughs> So if you get a third this class, this is pretty complicated. So if you get a third class relic, it's like, eh, whatever. Uh, you yeah. know what I mean? Okay. It's, like, it's kind of like, you know. No, oh, you'll see that a lot of times. Touch time. my hand. It, my, the movie star touched my hand. I'm never going to watch it it's again. Like, Joan Jett touched my hand. I've never watched it. Uh, yeah. I thought so. Okay. Joan Jett. Oh, baby. So, mm. Don't gross. <sighs> <laughs> love Joan. She's only little, by the way. I love rock and roll. Yeah, and Ron. And Ron. She's only little. Yeah, I believe uh, it. Okay. So anyways, let's go into the top ten relics. So just like on The Tonight Show and Dave Letterman, <laughs> we will start with number ten. So the number ten, top, tell, top ten relic of the world is... Yes. The Chains of St. Peter. The Chains of St. Peter. Apostle Peter was jailed in Jerusalem, shackled in an iron chain for preaching about Jesus. The night before the trial, St. Peter was said to have been released from the chains by an angel and let out of the prison. Today the chains are housed in a reliquary, reliquary? oh man, <laughs> reliquary, reliquary, under the main altar. Reliquary. Reliquary. Wow. In the, the San Pietro, oh gosh. The video, all right. Didn't you review these notes before you brought them? It's freaking Italian. I can't, <laughs> I can't speak English. Basilica in Rome. This is true. The legend says that when the Empress Eudoxia gave the chain to Pope Leo I, he held it. He held them next to the chain. Uh, wait a minute. He held them next to the chains from St. Peter's, Peter's first imprisonment. Wow. <laughs> You're killing this, Ron. Yeah. Okay. And the two chains fused together. Wow. So they took the last ones in that, and, and that's where they're housed. Okay. Man, I hope they get better than that one. I hope they do, too. I okay. think our audience is praying you know, they do. You know, I mean, no singing, no reading poems to you. <laughs> this is the next best thing. Maybe I'll have you read these. You want to read them? I don't care. Hmm. Well... Anyways. It's your bit. Number nine, please. Number nine. Let's move along. Okay. Check that out. That looks like Bigfoot. It is. It's the footprint of the Prophet Muhammad. All right. Number nine. Some Muslims believe that whatever the Prophet Muhammad, Muhammad roamed, his left foot made a lasting impression. Such footprints have been recovered from religious sites throughout the Midi Middle East and are now on display in mosques, museums, and other historical sites throughout the region. Oh. One such print is found in the Top, top Akapi Palace Museum in Istanbul, where it is displayed today. <laughs> was uh, one leg longer than the other or something? I don't know. Uh, that, his left foot, slept? whatever touched the earth, it always made his a big left impress. His foot made yeah. a, big, a big foot imprint. Okay. Yeah, see, so it's not just Catholics. We uh, have the, the Muslims as well. All right. Okay, yep. number eight, please. Here we go. The Grapevine Cross. Mm-hmm. Legend has it that St. Nino, a Cappadocian woman who preached Christianity in Georgia, and we don't mean the state, okay. that's the country, in the 4th century the was Ukraine? said... No, right? no Georgia. Georgia, it's... You I, said not the state. Right. Okay. So it's Ukraine. It's a country now. It's, well, it was in Russia, right? It was Georgia? in Russia. Okay. It's, a, it's own country. For Ukraine, Russia, whatever. Whatever. Okay. In the 4th century, 
was said to have been given a grapevine cross. The cross with particular drooping arms hmm, was made by the Virgin Mary herself. You're not going to see it on there. These are just the buildings. Oh, okay. It's like a, uh, it's original bearer, the cross, now is a major symbol of Georg Georgian Orthodox Church and wandered several countries before it found a home in the Sionani Cathedral in Tabaisi, <laughs> Georgia, <laughs> where it was now displayed. Yay, Van Helsing. They're killing me. He They're is. killing me. Wow. All, All right. right. Here we go. <laughs> Number seven. Oh, thank God. Up the top. Back in the USSR. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's your singing. The tunic of the Blessed Virgin. Oh. Okay. While Francis Chade's Cathedral, or Chade's, Chade's, Move man. along. Yeah. Chatre. Is one of the finest examples of Gothic architect. It is... It isn't the only reason pilgrims flock there each year. The cathedral is the home of the tunic said to be worn by the Virgin Mary during the birth of Christ. Ew. The tunic, or Sancha Camisia, mm -hmm. uh, was said to have been given to the church in 876. I remember that. <laughs> and was thought <laughs> to have do. been destroyed in the fire in 1194. Three, day later, later, three days later, it was found miraculously unharmed in the treasury, which the bishop claimed was a sign from the Mary herself. That a, wow, how do you like that? Wow. Mm. All right. So moving right along. Number six of the top relics of the world. You'll love this one. Buddha's tooth. Buddha's tooth? Buddha's tooth. Buddha? Buddha. You know Buddha? Yeah, you rub his belly for good luck. Yeah. Yeah? Like somebody, never mind. Shush. Uh, uh, according to Sarankian legend, a single tooth remained following Buddha's cremation. He left the canine. He, Shouldn't his, all his teeth be left? Teeth don't burn up. It's like they bone, don't. right? His left canine came to be an important possession as it was thought that whoever had the tooth had the canine. divine right to rule. Hmm. Wow. Unsurprisingly, the tooth was fought over many times. <laughs> but enjoys a peaceful setting in the Temple of the Tooth. Oh, thank God. I thought maybe you had it in your little kit. Okay. The Temple of the Tooth in Candy, Sri Lanka, with a K. Sri Lanka? Sri Lanka. Okay. Sri Lanka, whatever. All right. Are you ready? Number five of the top relics of the world, John the Baptist's head. Oh, God. At one time, there was thought to be seven. That's um, mm. um, interesting. Yeah, sure. Seven. Well, it's because they made up their own. Yeah. Uh, the final resting place of John the Baptist's head varies widely depending on the religion you subscribe to. <laughs> <laughs> the, Mo the Muslims believe it lies in the Uniya Mosque <laughs> in Damascus, <laughs> Syria, <laughs> while Christians believe the head is displayed at Rome's Church of San Silvestro in Caprite. Uh, is that okay? Capri? No, C A P I T E, Capite. Oh, okay. okay. Still, others believe it's uh, buried in Turkey and France. So there you go. That's almost as good as the grave of Santa Claus. What's that one? I don't know the grave. No, I talked about that at Christmas. As they argue over over that there's really he's really buried somewhere, but it's like three or four different places. Uh, okay. Uh oh. Yeah. You didn't lose the rest of your chop relics, did you? No, I just got to find them from the beginning. Oh, okay. Are we ready? Uh, see, I threw them off with Santa Claus. Yeah, that was okay, at Santa Claus. Okay, what are we on now? Yeah. Four? Number four. Mary's holy belt. Mary's holy belt. Which I'm going to give you in did a minute. Did it hold on her tunic? <laughs> Evidently. <laughs> <laughs> Mary originally Sorry. handed her... <laughs> Why is this written like this? Mary... Mary allegedly handed her hand-woven camel hair belt oh. to Thomas the Apostle just before she ascended to heaven, which okay. someday you will. It's kind of like the wampum belt. Yep. King Philip's wampum belt. When the belt was found, you know, the belt found its way to Prato, Italy, Italy in the 14th century, a special chapel was erected to house it. Today, the belt called Sacra Sintola wow. is a revered relic of the Virgin Mary and displayed five times a year, Christmas 
Easter, May 1st, August 15th, and Mary's birthday, September 8th. Okay. Wasn't that neat? That's cool. Yeah. Okay. Moving right along. Number three, Muhammad's beard. Muhammad's beard. Yep. They got his footprint, and now they got his now beard. Now they got his beard? Yep. Uh, said to have shaven from Muhammad's face by his favorite barber, post-mortem. Oh. The I prophet they weren't supposed to shave. You're supposed to smite them. Mortem. Mm. After they die, you can shave it off? Okay. Uh, I don't know. I didn't write this. The prophet's beard is on view today in the Topakaipi <laughs> <laughs> Palace Museum in Istanbul, Somewhere Turkey. Somewhere in Istanbul. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Though relics have no official sanction in Islam, the prophet himself preached against worship anyone than God. Many visit the museum. Extensive collection including the footprints of the prophet which we talked about earlier, okay. and uh, the beard. Wow. So there you go. Number two. Ah, you like this one. The blood of San Gennaro. Oh, I've actually heard of this one. Really? Okay. Yeah. You did? I did. Hmm. Each year, the people of Naples, Italy, gather on the anniversary of the martyrdom of their patron saint, San Gennaro, to watch a miracle. Oh, they get to see this. The liquefying of the saints' dried blood. And I'm going to talk about that after the okay. these are all over. All right. Uh, the miracle occurs like clockwork on September 19th, and as many as 18 additional times a year. The fact that the phenomena, you notice they say phenomena, just yeah. like paranormal phenomena, yes, has imagine. been questioned by scientists, has never stopped the celebration. Many believe the so-called miracle of the blood serves to protect the town from harm such as the uh, nearby Mount Vesuvius, and we know all about that, right? Vesuvius? Yeah, that too. Okay. Uh, the belief w has been partially legitimized in years when the blood failed to liquefy and bad things happened. Uh-oh. Witnessed in 1527's plague, an earthquake in 1980, and even the defeat of the Napoli soccer team. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Hey, you know, you know what I'm saying? That's a horrible thing. That's awful. Thing, yeah. You know, if that didn't liquefy, they oh. would have never lost. Oh, well. Mm. Anyway, so the number one relic of the world is the Shroud of Torah. Oh, Turin. I know that one. Yes. Even I know that, as lapsed as I am. Yep, the Shroud of Turin, yellowed, 14 feet long, linen. Uh, it's believed to be the burial cross, the burial cloth. cloth. Thank you very much. And uh, it has drawn uh, millions to the Italian city of Turin. Of course, that's where it's kept. Of course. While the shroud bears the image of a crucified man with wounds similar to those endured by genius, carbon dating in uh, the original one was dated at 1988 and showed the cloth between uh, 1260 and 1390. Therefore, it could not have been used to wrap a claw's body, but there is actually a lot of thing about it. Test results have never stopped uh, pilgrims flocking to it. And um, so anyways, but okay, that's the top 10 list. So we can switch back to me over here. <laughs> there we go. Here we are. Yes, okay. we're back. So the Shroud of Turin, which is an, a really interesting thing. Okay. Um, I had the opportunity, uh, the Passionates, okay, they're, they're a religious sect mm -hmm. of the Catholic Church. They have been commissioned by the Vatican to produce a certified replica of the shroud, and they take it around to different churches. Okay. And I had the rare opportunity to go to one of these and see it. It's 14 feet long. That thing is huge. Wow. Because it's it's both sides of the body. Oh, okay. So you know they wrapped it. So and it was really a, a great. In fact, uh, if if uh, Russ can home in on me right now, uh, I can hold these up right here. And he can home in on me and see that. Okay. These are actually scapulars. Uh, and you remember these, Anne, right? Oh, clearly. Yeah. 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 You mm -hmm. put them around your neck and you went, they burst into flames. Yep. Yes, right. You into they did. These, these yep. are the black scapulars of the Passionates. Okay. And they are uh, entrusted with this replica. It's an exact replica of it. Okay. Thank you very much, Russ. Okay. So this is, I got that there along with a couple other neat things. So, Russ, we can go back to the live shot. Thank you very much. <laughs> Unless you want to look at the middle of Ron's chest all night. We I don't know. Do that. It's, kinda, it's not very kinda exciting. Sexy, 
So anyways, uh, it was, it was kind of cool because they showed the, the shroud itself and they showed all the marks on it and they showed how a person suffered these. In other mm -hmm. words, you know, the, these are blood stains and so right. forth on there. Mm -hmm. So they actually took people out of the audience and showed them what it would look like and how, you know, they had their own, like a cloth they would put over it if they suffered the wounds. Mm -hmm. They put like a dye on them and everything. It was really interesting. That's cool. And uh, there's a lot of speculation about it. And yes, there was carbon dating done. But one of the things that occurred was that it was a fire as well. Right. In the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. where, where the, the Shroud of Turin was housed, and the cloth was repaired. So one of the theories is that the section that they took, because they were only given a little tiny piece of oh, the Shroud, because right. it is a relic, right. uh, was um, the section from that era where the fire occurred. Oh, could so, be. I mean, but interestingly enough, this year at SpiritQuest, of course, SpiritQuest is, is a, a yearly convention, or I hate to say a convention, paranormal experience, Yes. that I uh, hold every September, and uh, this year I believe it's on the 27th or so, whatever, you can check the website out. And, but it is called Angels and Demons, because we always do a theme, and I will be doing a presentation on the Shroud of Turing, and we'll be looking at all the different aspects of it. And awesome. I have, I have a seven foot reproduction of the Shroud of Turing. Oh, nice. So that I will have that on display along with some other artifacts mm -hmm. as well. So okay. it's going to be interesting. So if you want to learn more about the Shroud of Turin, you can go to SpiritQuest and uh, check that out. So that's, that's going to be kind of cool. NewEnglandGhostProject.com. There you go. NewEnglandGhostProject.com. So those are the top 10 relics of the world. Okay. So now we have another top 10 list, believe it or not. Uh-oh. And this is... Be afraid. This is really interesting. Uh, so, Russ, we are going to do the top 10 odd relics of the world. Okay. Because, you know, that's me. They're still relics, though. They are relics. Okay. They are official relics. They're official but relics. As I describe like them, Ron. you will see why they are odd. Like Ron. Like Ron. <laughs> so, can we have number 10, please? All right. This is the Mandy Lion of Edessa. The Mandy Lion, M-A-N-D-Y-L-I-O-N, so Mandy Lion. Okay. It's the poor man's Shroud of Turin. <laughs> All right. Uh, the Mandy Lion of Essa is a towel on which Jesus had dried his face. In other words, somebody gave him a towel and he dried oh, his face on okay. it. The legend behind the relic is the towel was created after a Turkish king, Agaba of Edessa, commissioned an artist to produce a portrait of Christ. Okay. After failing to capture Christ's brilliance, the artist was given a towel by Christ himself. When the artist returned with the Mandy Lion, the king was cured of leprosy. Oh, oh God. And leprosy. Mandy Lion of Essa remains song. one of the most important relics of the Vatican's collection and is currently resided in the Pope's uh, private chapel. Oh, wow. Yeah. So there you go. All right. There it is. All my skin All right. So number nine skin. of the artist relics. Yes. Number nine. Number nine. There we go. The Virgin Mary's breast milk. Oh, gross. So. Oh. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. Just think it's only number nine. Oh, man. There we go. Okay. okay. The holy breast milk was an extremely popular relic during the uh, Middle Ages. Really? An entire church, church was built outside of Bethlehem, Bethlehem on a rock which had mirac miraculous, miraculously, miraculously turned white uh -huh. after coming in contact with the, virgin, the virgin's milk as she breastfed Christ. Wow. Another legend says St. Bernard was praying before the statue of the Madonna when milk sprayed from the breast of the statue <laughs> into his mouth. <laughs> Many vials of milk were taken and transported all over Europe. French theologian John Calvin, had the Virgin Mary been a cow, her whole life would have been produced <laughs> <laughs> for such quantities. That's terrible. All right, move along, move along. What? Nothing to see here. Move along. Oh, my God. What is that? There we go. Number eight. Now, this is the only... That's somebody's this is, finger? This is the only item that, that made both lists. What this is, is it? This is Buddha's tooth. 
Oh, gross. Oh, it's Buddha's tooth. Ew. After Buddha was cremated, his ca left canine tooth was found in the ashes by his disciple oh. Kemba, who oh. gave it to the king of Brashamata so that could be venerated. Legend began to circulate, and the most prominent of which was that whoever possessed the divine right of the king, otherwise whoever was king. Uh, many wars were fought for no other reason to own a tooth. Okay, if you're listening to this show on a podcast, count yourself fortunate. That's all I have to say. Oh, you don't like his tooth? It's, it's, uh, yeah, no. The tooth was said to be responsible for converting many Indian kings to Buddhism. Performing okay. miracles each time it was threatened with destruction and is now placed within seven golden cas caskets and displayed on special ceremonies. Thank God. All right. Buddha's Keep tooth. going. Mm. Yeah. We're in the, wow, we're actually running out of yeah. time. Yeah. So you need to move along. Number yeah. seven, please. Here we go. Oh, isn't that more blood? Is yeah, that the it's blood more again? blood. St. Jarvis. Jarvis. Janus. How do you say that? Janus? You can't see. I get your finger over it. Uh, Januarius is. Jerry Ozzy ja blood. Januarius? Yep. yep. Is that the patron January after? Fiddly is the patron saint of blood banks. Oh, no. St. Jan, as I will call him, okay. was beheaded uh, at the volcanic crater of Sofla Fatter, <laughs> Tatter or something, in Tatter three, sauce? 305. The blood was saved by a woman called... Yushpia and taken <laughs> to Naples. <laughs> Allegedly, the conjugated blood liquefies like clockwork. Coagulated? Yeah, that too. Okay. Uh, preserved in two vials. The blood removed from the shrine three times a year, and I'm not going to give you the days. And thousand watch the blood turned into liquid. Wow. Yep. Just like that. Just like that. Okay, right. number, where are we? Six. Did I throw away six? I hope not. <laughs> he has to jump by where are we? and find it. Number six, where are you? Oh, here you go. <laughs> you sure it's six? Oh, I got it. Okay, number six. Here we go. It's the cloak of Muhammad. Oh, okay. I mean, we have the Turin of Mary, the so why not the cloak of Muhammad? The founder of modern Afghanistan, Amar Shah, once found a cloak of Muhammad in Boko Hara. Wanting the relic for himself, he was asked his keepers to lend it to him. <laughs> Adverse to lending such an item, I'm a shock about never to take the cloak away from a very large boulder. Their uh, trust proved undoing as soon the cloak became in the hands of the king and immediately removed from the rock and transported to Kandahar. The cloak is now kept in a shrine near the Amashah's tomb where a boulder also resides. Hmm. A what also is that? Or the boulder that was connected to the boulder. Oh, yeah. the boulder. Yeah. The boulder. All right, well, that makes on. sense. Okay. Move along. Number, number five. I thought we just did number five. No, that was six. Oh, okay. Five. Time flies by when you have fun. Oh, it is. Yeah, the Shrine of the Magi. All right. All right. The remains of three wise men arrived in Cologne in 1164 after being gathered in Jerusalem by St. Helena and after being held for a number of years in Constantinople and Milan. The shrine itself is elab elaborately decorated with gold-plated triple esophagus. Ooh, that's what we're looking at there, right? And held at the Cathedral uh, Cologne. It is the largest reliquary, reliquary, <laughs> whatever. Reliquary? Yeah, in the Western world. Relics have become such an important aspect of Cologne's sense of identity that the three crowns on the city's coat of arms represent it. So there you go. Okay. All right, moving along. Bounce. Number four of the <laughs> artist's relics. Oh, boy. Here we go. St. Teresa's of the Anvil's Hand. Oh. St. Teresa had a surprising role in the Spanish-American Spanish Civil War in the ensuing Franciscan, uh, Fran what's his name, Franco's di dictatorship. You know Franco? Okay. He ruled Spain. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Catholicism was a major aspect of Franco's regime, and St. Teresa was used as a propaganda tool in endorsing his offensive ideology and what representation of the traditional Spain. Wow. In uh, 1937, the future tyrant Francisco Franco acquired the hand of St. Teresa Ew. after it had been stolen from a convent in Ronda. Ronda? Ronda. 
He took the mummified hand wherever he went and even slept with it beneath his pillow. Oh, gross. That's <laughs> nasty. He was obsessed. Just to for it. luck? Yep. He was obsessed with to uh, and ended up in his death clutching it in 1975. Oh, how sweet. Okay, moving right along. Number three of the most odd religious things. And what could be worse than a hand? How about the whole arm? Oh. St. Magdal Mary the Magdalene's hand. Arm, arm, the whole arm. In 1191, St. Hugh visited the Abbey of Freycamp, shown, <laughs> shown the Abbey's relic of uh, Mary Magdalene's arm. He tried to take a piece, finding difficult to remove the chunky Oh. <laughs> Manual, he, uh, to the horror of the monk, he bit off two fingers. Oh, my God. <laughs> he justified oh, his actions. <laughs> oh, no. He justified his actions thusly. If a little while ago I handed the sacred body of the Lord with my fingers in spite of my worthiness and partook of it with the lips of my teeth, and why should I not treat the bones of a saint in the same oh, way? Oh, gross. Without oh, that's hard. Other words, saying if he's taking the Eucharist, why can't he just okay. take a nip out of uh, I think we should Mary move Mary along. Yes, I know we're going to run out of time. Out of time. Yeah, okay. Number two of oh, the oddest thingies. And this, of course, is St. Catherine of the Seneca's head. And we, now we have the whole head again. Okay. Yeah, that's we moved great. up from the whole arm to the she head. She looks like a zombie. Yes, I'm she does. sorry. Well, she's squatted in that picture, too. Yeah, she is, but okay. I'm sorry. St. Crath Catherine of Sen Senna uh, once received the vision that Jesus gave her wedding fing finger made of holy foreskin. Oh! Oh, no! <laughs> Great. Now the people in the she control died, room are shrieking. She died of a stroke at age 33 in Rome. Oh, Lord. However, the people of Seneca wanted her body to be venerated. Realizing that they couldn't take her whole body back, they cut off a head and oh. it on a, inside a sack. All when right. the guards stopped the thieves, they only found a hundred rose petals in the oh. bag and they had no choice but let them go. The head is still on display in Seneca, along with St. Catherine's dismembered thumb. Oh, gross. Okay, go to one because we've got two minutes left. Number one. Here we go. The holy foreskin. Oh, no. Also known as the Holy Purpose, P-R-E-P-U-C-E. -E. Okay. It's the earliest historic appearance of Jesus' foreskin oh, came gross. when Charlemagne uh, presented it to Leo II in 800. All right. Interestingly, uh, interestingly, most of the visions related to the Holy Foreskin were by female saints. That's St. Bridget disgusting. Bridget claimed to have had orgasms when... She, Bits of the right. foreskin dropped on her tongue by an angel. We got one minute uh, left. We're going to wind this up. <laughs> okay, take the picture down. We're done. We're done. We're done. We are so done. <laughs> we are so done. <laughs> I don't get it. Oh, my goodness. All right, so. We, I, we never even got into all this cool stuff. We have stuff all right these cool relics. We'll have to have another show just for Ron's relics. Yeah, who knows what I'll dig up by then. I'm afraid. I'm very afraid, and I just have to apologize for the holy foreskin. All right, I just want now, to say minute. this. That was that was on on the list. That came from. That's disgusting. That came from uh, the list. All right. All right. So, what what parting words of wisdom do we have to say? Because we do have to go. I just want to mention that I do have a, a first class relic, which is the blood of Saint Chabelle. Okay. And um, we're going to have to do another show on it. But All right. The story, how I got that relic and so forth. So okay. uh, I guess we have to go. Huh? We do have to go. They're going to just push us off the air here in a minute. Well, Ann, thank you so much. Uh, it was really interesting. It was fun. Thank you. And we will talk to you again next time.
From goalies to ghosties, long leggedy beasties, and things that go bump in the night. Deliver us, good Lord.